to have it. So um, I had the, the pleasure and honor to have um, dinner tonight with Charles Vinnick. Um, so I'm really, really even more excited about this presentation. And here is a little bit about him. He is the executive director of the Whale Sanctuary Project. Uh, a member of the Wales Sanctuary Project Board of Directors since mid-2016. Charles brings a unique blend of leadership and experience to his role as Executive Director. With a solid background in business that includes extensive experience in ocean policy, environmental policy, project management, and government relations. Thank God, you really need that. Charles is no stranger to ambitious, visionary, ocean-related projects. Charles previously worked for the Cousteau family for over 25 years, managing their ocean-related activities with positions as executive vice president and COO of Ocean Futures Society, vice president of the Cousteau Society, and Fond de Pouvoir of... Fond de Pouvoir. <laughs> it's been a long time since I took French. It's just a fun one. <laughs> one fun title in your life. <laughs> and it goes on. Oceanique Cousteau in Paris, France. His experience has afforded him the privilege of being in the wild with whales, including in his capacity as director of the program to return Keiko, the free willy whale, to the wild, as well as in his role as producer of Cousteau films. Before joining the Whale Sanctuary Project, Charles served as CEO of two environmental tech companies, Florida-based Ecosphere Technologies Incorporated and Aquantis Inc. in Santa Barbara. Locally in Santa Barbara, where he had to drive up from today, thank you again so much for doing that, Charles has also served as CEO of the Santa Barbara <coughs> City College Foundation and is a founding board member of Heal the Ocean. He has received commendations from the White House for his work with youth education and from the Los Angeles City Council for Community <coughs> Environmentalism. He currently also serves on the board of directors of Heal the Ocean and Ocean Futures Society. Please help me in extending a very heartfelt welcome. That's more than anyone should have to <laughs> say about me. What, I, what I'm going to try to do tonight, I'm going to do two or three things. One, the project to reintroduce Keiko to the wild was really a four, well, almost a seven-year project. I'm going to talk about a piece of it in 20 minutes. So obviously not the whole story, but some interesting pieces and hopefully some things that can lead to a little bit of a shorter talk on the Whale Sanctuary Project and how those two activities interrelate. Now before getting started, I just want to thank Christine and Robin. Thank you very much for inviting me and Gail for all of the work that you've done to pull this together. And I want to acknowledge at least three people who are here, Mark Palmer, Michael Reppy, and Elise Dufour, who were also involved in the Keiko project at various times. So it's not just me, and as we get into questions and answers, they may have things to say as well. Now, is there a way to turn part of the lights down? Michael, you've got some light switches right behind you. See if any of those will do anything interesting. Not total darkness, but something more than we have. Well, that's <laughs> So we get. How about this? Do you get this? No, we don't get that. You want to hold it? Turn it off. Let's see how we go. Like that? No, that's too dark. Okay. All right. So I think this will work in any case. So we'll start with Keiko. And I'm going to tell you some observations about all of our work in Iceland. Okay. Now this is timed. I can only do this so many times. Okay. Okay. Here we go. So I think as all of you know, Keiko was a movie star. And but for the film Free Willy, 
he would never have been a whale that would have been selected for reintroduction to the wild. Because at the time the movie was made, he was languishing in Mexico City with a papilloma virus that you'll see on his pecs and was really a very sick whale in a pool that was no deeper than he is long. And yet it was because of children around the world, thousands and thousands of children, who wrote letters and cards to Warner Brothers and others to say that Keiko needed a new lease on life. And so as we think about whales today and what we're all doing to help whales, we need to think about the children who will lead this effort going forward because those are the people who will carry this on and who we need as leaders. And they were the ones who brought this for Keiko. Could you use a mic because the music here is competing? The music is done. <laughs> so here, I want to give you a sense of what, there is no mic. Also, I want to give you a sense of what it takes to actually move a whale. So here we are in Newport, Oregon with the team, and they're actually having worked with Keiko for months and months to acclimate him to go into a stretcher. So Jeff Foster, who was the head of our team, Brian, Peter, Karen, and Jen. And so all of these people were part of that team to move Keiko from Newport to Iceland. And it's a big project, and part of it is making sure that Keiko is calm and that everyone else is calm and they're safe in a pool where you're able to make the water very shallow and use a crane to put him up into what is basically a very large tank, a plastic tub that he will travel into Iceland. And here we're in there, and you'll notice the white on him. You have to keep him moist with A and D ointment for the whole trip. Now usually, C-130s are used by the captive industry. This is the only time the U.S. Air Force has leased a C-17 to a private group because we have to travel 5,000 miles, taking off on a very short runway and landing on a very short runway, air to air refueling twice along the route so we could take off light and land light. And part of it is you're trying to be in the air as short as possible because you can't put salt water in a plane. So he has to travel in fresh water. And that's part of the reason you keep him moist with the A&D ointment. So then we're landing on a short runway in Vespin Air, Iceland. Actually, the landing gear broke. We can talk about that later. It had nothing to do with the whale. But as you can see, it was nervous time for all of us inside the plane. And then how do you move a whale from the plane to the bed? There are big trucks and cranes. So unlike moving a whale from park to park, here you've got to have equipment that can go out over the whole bay. You need barges and ships. You need the large cranes. You need construction engineers in order to get Keiko into the bay pen that has been erected as his first step of his new home. So here we've been out of the water for roughly 17 hours from Newport, Oregon to Iceland. Keiko at this point was a little over 10,000 pounds. He'd gained 2,000 pounds in weight in Newport from when he was in Mexico City. Very healthy animal, but had not moved for, as I say, the last 17 hours. So it's a little bit of nervous time. And here you see Jeff Foster being that nervous <laughs> and wanting to make sure that as Keiko gets in the water, he starts to move again. And he does. And immediately, on entering the water, took a big swim around the bay pen. Now, this was September 9th of 1998. Water's still cool. <coughs> but not as cold as it gets. <laughs> so that's his first swim in the bay pen in 
What's the problem? <coughs> but it took a very large team spending inordinate amount of time to build the infrastructure for Keiko. And as we think about sanctuaries in the future, we need to think about that kind of expense, time, and effort. And here they're sewing the gate to the net because eventually we'll want Keiko to come through the barrier net out into the open ocean through that gate. So that was part of the design to enable them to do so. And here you have the view from above from the cliffs, the harbor on your right, and then this is Kletzvik Bay, which the area of the Bay Pen and the like. But they hadn't quite told us about the storms. <laughs> this is in June, actually. It's the summer. So we've tried to make changes to make this more acceptable and a better environment for the people. Keiko doesn't care. Keiko's kind of happy in this. He'll come up out of the water, he'll open his mouth and get the spray, and he can swim in it. For the people, it's tough duty. It's not tough duty for Keiko. So that's what we hadn't expected. But we learned to live with it over the five years that we were there. <coughs> so this was our fleet to take Keiko out into the wild ocean. Grapner, Papner, Danielle, and then a big fishing boat that we leased, Gandhi, so we could stay out at sea for a couple of weeks at a time with the whale. Earlier the first year we didn't have Gandhi, and we were coming back in almost every night. Didn't have enough time out in the wild. We also had a helicopter, and the helicopter made all the difference in the world because we could find wild whales. And in addition to the work with Keiko, we were able to do research, and we added 350 whales to the North Atlantic, to the Norwegian and Icelandic portfolio of photo identification of whales. This is Jen Shore doing some of that photo ID. And this was research that really hadn't been done very extensively in Iceland and Norway at the time. This is really almost 20 years ago. We also found three whales with bent dorsal fin. Now initially that was exciting because maybe they were relatives of Keiko and we were looking for his family. But with DNA testing we found they were not. And what's interesting is usually bent dorsals are associated with captive whales. And here we found them in the wild three of them, and of course Keiko was a fourth. And there could be many more, but we don't know why. And then we began the effort of teaching Keiko to go through the gate out into the bay. Now the first time he went through that gate, looks both ways, no, I'm not going through there. <laughs> He's very cautious, and it took weeks of training for him to get comfortable to go through the gate into the bay, and then once he did, swimming around and experiencing a natural bottom for the first time. Critters, starfish, crabs. And he began to experiment with those. For him, they were a new experience. He'd been captured at the age of two and he's 24 at this time. But certainly came to enjoy that area and have a quality of life in the bed. And then it was time to take him out on what's called open ocean walks. Take a whale for a walk. Now wrap your arm around that for a bit. How do you do it? Well, you train the whale to follow a boat. And in this case, there he is. He's got both a training device of the ball on the stick that he's used to, and also he's reinforced by Steve Clawson, who throws fish. And we went out for hours and hours and hours, both to get him used to the open ocean, but equally importantly, to build his stamina so that he could so that he could end up being able to swim a hundred miles a day with the wild whales. And he had never done that before in his life. So we needed to build his stamina just like you would for a marathon. And that's what these training sessions were about. And then also we're out looking for wild whales with which he can interact. Because the whole purpose is to see if a family will accept him and if he'll be interested in them. Uh, and we went through that every summer from May till September. Then the weather got too bad, we couldn't go out. 
and we'd start again the next May if he was showing progress. So here are a few encounter scenes. So you're hearing Jeff, Good, and he's uh, talking to the helicopter. The helicopter pilot is identifying where there are wild whales, and how close they are, and what direction they're coming from, how many there are, how close they are. The big ocean, you can miss them every day without that helicopter to find them. We would basically position the boat and position Pico so he would be near them and then he was free to do whatever he wanted. We would not interfere unless he was in danger and he never was. You can pick out Keiko by the yellow tag on his dorsal fin which is a satellite tag. And if he left, we could track where he went. Yeah. It's a pretty scary guy. You know, as a person, you go, whoa, what's going to happen to our way? But in fact, he was very comfortable. He would go near them, usually move away. And then they would sometimes be interested. More often, not at all. And we're probably 10 miles offshore at this point. Can't go by the side of the platform, which was where he felt most comfortable. He was a little concerned, but he would often swim off a mile or a mile or two. But generally, if there were whales around, he might come back if he was uncomfortable or stay nearby them, but not necessarily integrated with them. That's right. Jacob's right here. Nine o'clock. Another counter here that's pretty interesting. Down a little deep up here. Uh, it's the helicopter pilot in the background. Another big vocal. Cool <laughs> Door open because we're filming. What you're seeing. I'm serious. And he's definitely showing an interest. He's approaching from the rear of them. God, this position's kind of hooked up. Getting a little closer, maybe at 20 meters, 10 meters off their tail. Right here, 10 meters off their tail. Off their tail right now, uh, probably 20 feet. Uh, he turned back towards Danielle, and they all sunk out. So he's swimming back to the boat, if there's a whale right behind him. Uh, yeah. Are they right here? Mitch, you have visual on Keiko? They're right by the platform off the right, or he might have company with him. He's got a whale with yeah. him. They're right off the platform. Now, what gave us confidence in the progress that Keiko was making? is that every summer in June, he would basically take off where he left off the previous August in terms of his comfort level with wild whales. And it's this image that gave us the most confidence. He swam up to the tails of a group of whales that were swimming away from him, touched one, and then came back. And that was enough progress to say to our funders and the like, let's do it again the next summer, even though there's eight or nine months of brutal winter that you have to deal with inshore. But it's this image particularly that led me to be able to say to our funders, we have to keep going. Now I want to tell you a little story about the intellectual capacity, the communication of whales, and how they work together. The imagery you're seeing is not of Iceland. It's of the Northwest. But I want you to see whales while I'm telling you this experience that I had. I was in the helicopter above Keiko. We were about 10 miles offshore. And there were 15 whales coming toward Keiko. They were about two miles away. When they got to a mile away, 
The 15 whales separated into three groups, and five kept coming toward Cape. Five went wide to the east, and five went wide to the west. And the five that kept coming to Keiko came right up to him. They all thrashed around for a little while. Nobody was terribly interested, and they swam on. They got about a half mile beyond, and I'm watching from the helicopter. And the five from the east and the five from the west joined up with their group, and they all swam off. So what had we seen? We'd seen a group of whales come upon something a mile or two away from them that they didn't know. And they figured out a plan to deal with it without putting the whole group at risk. They communicated the plan and they executed the plan. Now we had hydrophones in the water the whole time. And there were no sounds before the actual interaction. And yet, they dealt with it and communicated it effectively. It's a story that has stayed with me for all those years because it illustrates how they communicate, how they plan, and how they work together as a group. tell where the whales are, where the birds are dying. Yeah. <laughs> and it does help. So in the summer of 2002, Keiko, as I say, started, took off just where he was before, often staying this far away from a huge group of whales that were feeding on a herring ball. And from the first day we took him out, he stayed with the whales. So we left him to do that. And he traveled about 100 miles a day with them around the island. Orca often grate their teeth on the gates of their enclosures, destroying their teeth that then end up being drilled out on almost a daily basis in order to prevent infection. And they also get ill and die young. The Vancouver Aquarium on the right, a mother and her daughter died within months of one another. And that was in 2017, and today we still don't know why they died because the parks don't provide that information transparently. They live very difficult and short lives in tanks, even though we tend to see them doing tricks and supposedly smiling. What's happening in the world? There are 3,000 whales and dolphins in captivity. There are over 480 bottlenose dolphins, 80 belugas, and 23 orca in North America. And in Canada, as I said, marine land, over 50 belugas and one orca. Time to do something. So the Whale Sanctuary Project was founded in 2016, became active in the middle of 2017 with a mission to create the first permanent seaside sanctuary in North America for cetaceans, for belugas and orca particularly, that are being retired from marine parks so that they can live a high quality life in a marine sanctuary. We have more than 50 advisors, Sylvia Earle, Jean-Michel, Carl Safina, Hal Whitehead, and the 50 represent all of the key disciplines that you need in order to successfully design, create, build, and maintain a sanctuary. So we have expertise in all of these areas, mostly volunteers. So what's a sanctuary? What's an authentic sanctuary? Because we hear about sanctuaries, you hear about them in the Caribbean, dolphin sanctuaries and the like, but do they have these characteristics? Can the animals thrive in that setting? So resident well-being, the whale's well-being, is the only priority. There is no commercial priority in an authentic sanctuary. No performances, no breeding, and no unnecessary invasive procedures. Basically, if you have whales in a sanctuary, you want to go out of business because you hope eventually you solve the problem. 
Provide them autonomy, give them free choice, give them space, give them room to experiment with their environment. And also provide authentic education. <clears throat> Parks always talk about education. They talk about how much they're providing, they're helping children learn about whales. But what are they teaching? <clears throat> they're teaching children that we are superior beings to those animals, and they're giving them a level of arrogance about how to interrelate with the natural environment. We need to provide authentic education about conservation, provide full data sharing, complete transparency. When an animal dies, tell the world why. It will help the next whale, and it will help our science. And it has to be sustainable. When you take the first animal into a sanctuary, these are long-lived animals. You have to be able to provide for it for its life, or you shouldn't take it. So in building a sanctuary, you've got to have the whole thing planned for 50 years out and funded or have a path to funding or you shouldn't take the first animal. So where are we doing it? We're looking in Nova Scotia, British Columbia, and Washington State. We looked at desktop studies, about 140 sites. We then visited 30 of them. We narrowed it down, kept looking. And we're now focused on a handful of sites in Nova Scotia, a couple in the San Juan Islands, Gulf Islands of British Columbia, and a few up in the Johnstone Strait. We can talk more about those in question and answer. But that's the process we're going through. We have two full-time people, a couple of part-time people, and some volunteers. We're on the road a lot. The drive here was actually less than it was in Nova Scotia a week ago when I was driving up and down the coast of Nova Scotia. And I, the interesting thing there, just as the side while we're talking. There's 8,000 kilometers of Atlantic coast in Nova Scotia. We were doing town meetings. So I would say to the fishermen particularly, well, I could drive this coast for the rest of my life. And I would never find the ideal sites that you may already know because the roads don't go to the coast and the land is private. And half the time I can't even see the coast. But with your help, with the help of the fishermen, then we can identify whether there are viable sites somewhere along that coast. And it's that kind of inclusiveness that's critically important to any kind of sanctuary site selection. <clears throat> so what's a sanctuary? This is an artist rendering, obviously. But it's like roughly 60 to 100 acres. Room for five to eight orca. <coughs> Hopefully there'll be a nature trail nearby where the public could see from a distance how whales are interacting in the wild. There'd be a minimal care facility somewhere around the perimeter of that site. Ideally, it would be a perfect cove like this. I haven't found it yet, but ideally it would be that. There'd be a buoy net, just like in Iceland, closing off the bay. Now, everyone says these are orca. We see them jump over things all the time in parks. And they can jump over that net and they'll leave. Well, in fact, they could but they never have. Even when they've been captured and surrounded by nets, they've never jumped out of them. So roughly three foot diameter buoys would hold up that net. It would be anchored to the bottom with chain like you saw in the pictures of Iceland. And it would have a security net about 20 meters further out, not for the whales, but to keep people further away with boats. So that's the ideal. It might be islands that are netted together. Could be anything, but this is the ideal picture of a 100-acre sanctuary. <clears throat> Around 50 feet deep, as I said, five-day residents in that size, ecologically responsible, we have to keep that environment pristine for the whales as well as for the human people living nearby. Build it with community <coughs> partnerships, as I described a minute ago, particularly with <coughs> fishermen around the world. And it's an opportunity to design the project with them. It may not look like the rendering I just showed you once we get into working with a community to bring it together with them. We'll provide rescue and rehab for wild whales today when a whale is ill. The only place it can be taken, if it needs to be taken anywhere, is a marine park. Belugas in, in, in Alaska a year ago ended up in San Antonio, Texas at SeaWorld because there's nowhere else to treat them. We build a sanctuary, we can assist all the rescue and rehab groups that are already doing work. The Marine Mammal Center here is remarkable, but they're not able to handle a whale. 
Can we help them? Can they help us if we build a sanctuary? Of course. That kind of collaboration is part of what the future is. We would have all kinds of education. My dream is that the marine parks, obviously, where are we going to get a whale? We're going to have to partner with the marine parks. That their amphitheater would be a large screen theater, and we would project from a sanctuary back to their trainers in that theater, and they would be describing the education and the activity from a sanctuary. We'd be teaching children about nature from nature. We have all kinds of opportunities with today's technology to beam anything we want from underwater, above water, and the like, and create authentic education. So what is this? In many ways, I think it's leaving a legacy for our children, certainly for whales in the natural world. So with that, I thank you and open it up to questions. Of Keiko, how long did you think it was going to take? An hour and a half. <laughs> no, it's a very interesting question because it changed a lot. I mean, I think the, the, and we had veterinarians with us in Iceland, and the very first time we took Keiko out and he actually interacted with wild whales, he, now this is anthropomorphizing from the highest level, <laughs> he appeared to be scared and went, one direction and the whales because there were two juveniles and mother whales they went the other way <laughs> and some of our team said hey he's gone he's free we're done he took off well yeah he took off scared to death <laughs> so we went and found him and it took us three days to come back very slowly with one of those open boats providing pizza to the people on the boat as quick as we could for them to get him back to the bay. And he was not with whales at all. He was just off on his own, kind of languishing. So in that sense, people thought he was free. But what's free for a whale? It's joining a family. And that was a learning process we had to go through along with the whale, because part of what who do you bring to do work like this? It had never been done before. So we had the animal care staff from the Newport, Oregon Aquarium that had been with him for a couple of years, that loved him dearly and treated him perfectly. But we had to train him to follow the boat, train him to go through a gate, train him to do the things that he would have to do in the wild. Basically untrain him from being a performing whale. And the people had to learn the same untraining. So it's a, it's a, it was a very long process to get our heads around that and the whole thing was about would he join whales and would they accept him and we never found his family even though we went to Iceland because that's where he'd been captured 25 years earlier. So we did DNA sampling, we did all kinds of stuff. We never found a match. Had we found a match, might it have been different? I don't know. So he never actually joined a group and was integrated. He was hanging out right next to him, following him, intrigued as could be, but not fully integrated. So in that sense, we did not succeed in helping him join a family forever. But we gave him a quality of life that, in my mind, no other captive whales ever had. So those are, you know, how do you deal with that? Tough stuff. Yes, ma'am. So did you give up? Did he die? What did you put Okay, so the rest of that story, as, as told, he swam to Norway. We then put people there. Actually, he got about oh, 30 miles off the coast of Norway. We were falling by satellite. I kept going by boats. I never saw him the whole time, although I got close. I was over him in a helicopter. I could hear him, but I couldn't see him. Got to Norway. Fishing boat. By that time, people knew the bent dorsal fin whale was coming their way. It had been in the press. Fishing boat started throwing him fish, and he followed him home. <laughs> Up a fjord, and he stayed in that fjord. We moved people there to care for him. 
and he was there for the next year and a half. So he was then almost 27 years old. And he was free to come and go. We didn't net off that fjord or anything else, but we were there to feed him, to care for him. Uh, but he was basically free. But there were no herring to speak of, and there were no whales in that area. So he was basically on his own. He caught a cold, a respiratory disease, in the summer, in the winter of 2003, and died in December of 2003. And he was buried there in Norway. Now, he caught respiratory ailments like that all the time, almost every winter, one time or another. And what you do is you feed them tons of antibiotics and bottles to start cleaning, <laughs> and you, you do that. And it's, uh, that's how you care for them in captivity. In this instance, he was so free that we, the team that was there, probably didn't notice that he was ill right away because he wasn't coming in all the time. He was free to come and go. And he died of that, of that respiratory illness there in Iceland, and in Norway, I'm sorry. What's the lifespan on those? Well, in the wild, male whales 40 to 60 years, females 60 to 80, some even older. In captivity, less than half. And of all the captive, of all the wild-caught captive whales, the average age has been four years in captivity before they die. Of captives. Now, almost all today were born in captivity, but they're born of weird families, you know, all kinds of whales. And often, females and their offspring are separated almost immediately. Uh, so SeaWorld, uh, the uh, fake news, which we also call lies, uh, predate the Trump administration with regard to SeaWorld, and I'm happy that we are suing them because of the false information that they put out about orcas will be in trial in October uh, in Oakland, and we're hoping to, for a big victory then. But, but Charles and his team, Jean-Michel Cousteau, my boss, David Phillips, did a tremendous job with Keiko. It really was a, a historic event of releasing this uh, uh, animal and bringing them back to the wild. <coughs> Thanks. Let's go. Before Keiko swam to Norway, how many years had you, you know, you said we, were, we, were in, we were through four full years, a little more than four years in Iceland, and then a year and a half in Norway. Let's go. Why do you think you swam that far away? It, to me, it seems like this animal was so habituated to being around humans that I kept asking myself, why did they even have a gate up? If he could have jumped over it and he didn't, then he also wouldn't have swam through it and he wouldn't, you know, and this whole training about training him to like swim through the gate, he wouldn't have done it on his own so that he could have been in that bay and he probably would have stayed there if he had not prompted him to like go out in the ocean. So I'm just wondering like, so, so now he is out in the ocean. Why do you think that he swam so far? Well, the fact is, I mean, as I mentioned in the story, uh, in, the, in the film, in that summer, the very first time we took him out, he didn't stay with our boat. He went to the wild whales. And he stayed with those wild whales around the island of Vespinar for the next three and a half weeks with the wild whales. So he was with them on his own. So at our minds, that was him making a choice not to come back to the bay pen. He knew where it was. He knew where the bay was. He didn't come back at all in those three and a half weeks. And then he left the island clearly with whales. He'd been with them the whole time. Somewhere, and there's, this is the, the mystery, you can't know, we can't know, when along that journey was he alone and when was he with whales? He was diving to 300 feet almost daily because that reading I got every morning at 8 o'clock from the satellite. I could tell where he was and where he dove. I couldn't tell where he was an hour later, which made it difficult to find him. Also, you can't, you can't go in a single engine plane over the ocean. A dual engine plane, you're going at 60 knots. So you can't see him in the waves. So it's very hard to find him out there and I did get some naval help, but didn't quite find him with their help either, and a helicopter. But he was clearly on his own that whole time, diving deeper than he had ever been known to dive in Iceland. Would he have done that on his own? I don't think so. He was doing it with whales. Can I be sure of that? Of course not. But for seven weeks, 
He was on his own, feeding himself, choosing to be out in the wild. He made the choice to do that in Iceland, unlike what you just described of he wouldn't leave. He chose to. So in that context, he was betwixt and between. He was unclear. But once he then got to Iceland, I'm sorry, to Norway, and then people were feeding him. Once he got up into the fjord, children were jumping in the water. It took 30 hours to get the Norwegian government to pass a law that you couldn't jump in the water with Keiko. 30 hours was how quickly that law got passed. And then we continued with that process. So, you know, hard to tell. Yeah, over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, as far as the, uh, you know, you mentioned his lifespan, but, um, and you said originally he was uh, pulled from a pod, I guess, up in Iceland. He was caught in Iceland at the age of two, yes. Okay. So, what is, like, I, I understand some of the Pacific uh, whales, but on the, over in Iceland, what is their migration pattern for most of those pods? Where are they kind of going? First from? of all, a lot of it is unknown because they haven't been, I mean, we know so much about JK and L pod. In, the, in San Juan Islands. Right. That, we know more about those whales probably than any other group except one woman who's been studying a group in, in New Zealand for almost as long, Ingrid Visser. But in Norway, they haven't been studying them, nor in Iceland. So we don't know. They tend to go between Iceland and Norway, and they come back and forth. Now, they're there during the summer months, quite a bit around the, the Westman Islands, but not in the winter. And they show up roughly mid-June, because we would be out there in May looking for them. We didn't find them. And by September, they're gone. Often over to Norway. But exactly the pattern, like we know for JK and Alpad, we don't have that information. And you find orca in every ocean. Right, right. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the pen and infrastructure that was all put in place, is that still there and something that's able to be used now? I mean. It Obviously, it'd be nice to have one in North America, but it seems like a lot of work was put towards setting Well, that, that, all that infrastructure is not there. The anchors are still there. The chain is still there. And in fact, there is a group, Merlin Entertainment, is a, they own a lot of parks around the world. They've made a commitment from their origin not to have any cetaceans in their parks. They happen to have bought a park in Taiwan, I believe it is, with two belugas. And they've made a commitment to create a sanctuary for those two belugas, and they've contracted with the same town to use the same bay. Now, here's the problem. I showed you the weather. That storm, or storm just like that, two weeks after we arrived, destroyed all of our infrastructure. We lost the medical pen. We never had it again, medical lift. It took us almost a year to rebuild all of the netting and the anchors and the like, and the danger in the storm for some of the people who were trying to make sure the whale was safe was very high risk. People I found in Iceland, our team, when I first got there, we were 30 days on, 30 days off. Well, that's really expensive. Let's try 60 on, 30 off. Didn't work. Everyone's remote. Their families are somewhere else. They think this is a temporary job because Keiko's going to find a family and immediately go off into the wild hill yonder with his family. And a year and two and three, you're still doing it. So I found a remote location like that was very difficult, not for the whale, but for the people. And I think that's the problem with that location if you were trying to do it long term. So as we're looking for sites now, we have some remote sites. But I'm really holding out for some of the sites that are not remote. Is it tough to do something in the San Juan Islands? Of course, with the res southern resident issues, putting a sanctuary there, it's dicey, challenging. But boy, if you can do something near a town where your staff can live, where their children can go to school, where they can go to a restaurant. There are two restaurants on the island of of Espinar. <laughs> one of them is pizza, and the other one is, I don't know, I've, good I've pizza. something. Good pizza, but you can only eat it so often. <laughs> we took over a hotel that was half built, and our team in the winter would build the rest of the rooms because there was nowhere to live. Those are the things that really are the real, are the rest of the story, as they say. 
Yes, sir. Can you dig into the Southern residents and the implications if, the, if, if it would seem like the synergies of having the sanctuary there and potentially helping solve I see the shaking. I, I'm curious what the implications are because the shipping up there, all the issues we have to water, right? How would this positively or negatively impact this? Well, I think, I think first of all, the, the, you all heard the question about southern. Okay, southern residents in the San Juan Islands. What are the implications of having a sanctuary nearby? Obviously, I have a bias about this, but let's you know let's <laughs> let's talk about it clearly. There are concerns that the paths of the of the whales and therefore their feeding patterns might be disrupted by something new. And they would tend to spend time there, perhaps not taking care of finding food and their social environment and the like. So people, some people, are concerned about any kind of change in the environment that could stress the animals any more than they are already stressed. Now, let's talk about some of the benefits as well. Right now, you had a whale this past summer, J50, her, four, three and a half years old, horribly undernourished. Team went out, our team, a number of other organizations under the auspices of NOAA to see if we could A, take blood samples, fecal samples, breath samples, find out what was wrong with her, find out a treatment, figure out what to do with her. Weren't able to get close. In the end, she passed away in September before anyone was able to do much, although we got a lot of samples. And if that whale had, if there was intervention needed and deemed appropriate by a cadre of veterinarians and organizations and NOAA, the only place it could have gone was SeaWorld or Vancouver Aquarium. If a sanctuary was there, it could provide a rescue and rehab benefit, have all the gear ready to go every time you need to do sampling, be able to cooperate with the Marine Mammal Center and other experts in the area of rescue and rehab, and if needed, be a place for respite, and then hopefully reintroduction to the wild. So I think the benefit potential, particularly given the stress on the southern residents, because that's going to happen again. We have two more whales right now that are being observed to be very underweight, and they're much older. One of them's 25. And so, the ability to do that work hand in hand, as well as taking care of the captives, I think is a benefit. I also, we had wild whales come by Caicos Pen. They'd come by and they'd go on their way. So there isn't a lot of data about most of these kinds of questions. Then it becomes opinion. Can you try it? Can everybody agree? And that's the negotiation that has to go on with all the stakeholders, all your veterinarians, scientists, and all the rest of us. Yes, sir. Uh, how different are the dialects between wild groups of whales, and how much of, is that a problem of trying to get Keiko or another whale integrated? Very much a problem. I mean, the pods generally have their own dialect. Certainly the super pods, I mean, there's similarities, and we would often be in the water, and I'd be with someone new, a scientist who came over, we'd have hydrophones in the water, and they'd say, oh, that's a happy sound. That's a sad sound. This, and we, you got here yesterday. I, how, where's the data? And sometimes, but it's been studied a lot. And the pods do have different dialects. <coughs> SeaWorld has lost share price and attendance as their stockholders vote with their feet and their attendance dwindles because of all of us. That pressure that shows their business model doesn't work anymore forces them to look for a new business model. That legislation in Canada, you got the worst place in, in North America is Marine Land of Canada, far worse than any sea world. But if that legislation goes through, they have to stop breeding. And they've been breeding those belugas like mad. There are 55 of them. <coughs> what they, they've already separated them. Where will they, what will they do? Their business model is done. Then they have to do something, and if we are there to help them, and in the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether it's us. What if SeaWorld decides they're going to do a sanctuary as their model? Well, if they do it right, and it was an authentic sanctuary, which I think are two very big leaps, we should applaud them. We're going to need to work with the captive industry if we're going to make the change. So 
I've tried to go see folks at Miami Sea Aquarium every time I'm in Florida. I let them know I'm there. Certainly like to have a meeting. Eh, it hasn't happened yet, but they've talked on the phone. I'm talking to the vets at SeaWorld. Can it happen? Slowly. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I just asked four questions. And, you know, all of them. Okay. One. <laughs> Knowing that you know most of these aquariums and these sea worlds, I'm just kind of curious, like a newer one like the Atlanta Aquarium, are they anybody coming up with better ways? Of Great question. The second that? thing is, is anybody still taking them from the wild or are they all bred? Great question. And the third question is, are they bred by artificial semination or natural? Next. And the last one, the fourth one, is, uh, and I don't want to put a damper on it, but is this possibly coming up with a sanctuary going to encourage these parks to go, oh, this is a great place to retire Betsy over here. <laughs> and we'll just bring in Give them the worst one, yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Sure. You're the oh, worst yeah. ones yeah. and the ones that are yeah. sick. Good question. Yeah. So what was the first question? Repeat <laughs> <laughs> it, huh? Yeah. yeah. I just want to see if you what can. about new facilities? Is there anyone that's actually coming so, up with better facilities? So like with respect, Atlanta, to, with respect to aquariums, what's going on in the aquarium world, the zoo world? Well, there's one wonderful story. The National Aquarium in Baltimore, John Racanelli is the director of it, been the director for years. John has made a commitment to move his dolphin, he has eight dolphins, to a sanctuary they will build in the Caribbean, and they're doing it now. He's already started growing algae in the tanks where they are to get them acclimated for a move to the wild. Now, he thought he was going to do it in Florida, for a bunch of reasons, decided Florida wasn't going to work. He's now working on a couple of spots in the, in the Caribbean, and he will do that. He is the leader in this area from the captive industry. And he says it with, stands on a platform to say this is the thing to do. So you've got someone from within the industry demonstrating that not only can they do it, but that it's cost effective for them to do so as well for their business model. That's pretty cool. Now, are there others? you got the Georgia Aquarium, which is the opposite. They're still looking to get more belugas. They keep trying to find a way to import belugas. It's horrible. They only have two so far. Well, they have two left. Two left. Yeah, but they're looking for more. And so, and they'll, you know, move them from others. Because you don't need a permit to move the whales from park to park. And so there are certain things like that you have to watch. So there are a couple of bright lights, but in the main, not so many. Second question. Breeding. Uh, breeding. Uh, breeding. Are they dictating? Both. Any, first of all, any more? Oh, yeah. Are any more being caught? Well, here's the, here's, here's the worst story of the day. Russia captured 100 whales in the summer. 90 roughly beluga and 11 orca. They are still in horrible conditions near Vladivostok in pens. The ice has come in. At least three of the belugas, and many of the belugas are very young. And still weaned, not yet weaned. They're going to die. This is not going. This is not a good story. And three of them have died. It looks like in the last week, an orca has died. Mark and his team and others have been very involved. There's a group around the country and the world trying to have input into this. The government has said, well, it's probably we're not going to let them be sold to China. The biggest trade right now is parks in China captures from Russia. Hmm. Pressure is being put on them, but it's very bureaucratic and we don't know what's going to happen. But we're, we're all trying, but it's a, it's a difficult situation. But those are the two worst examples. Captures in Russia, sold to China, but they're not the only ones. But it's the, the largest part of that story. Breeding. How does it take place? Just the way you'd expect and artificially. <laughs> So what's happened in marine land of Canada is there's a lot of natural breeding going on, almost unsupervised, if you will. How do you prevent breeding? How will you in a sanctuary if you're not going to allow it? Through birth control. Done all the time, but oftentimes they're managing the process in the parks. Fourth question. See, you forgot it. <laughs> not just me. No, the last question was the hard one. Ah. But basically, is the sanctuary that you're talking about possibly going to encourage the parks to start 
basically retiring old Betsy over here. Yeah, well, with, and with this, giving you the old to sit, yeah, with, and with, then also bringing reading more because they want you, you know, younger. Right. right. Well, I mean, shows. so the question is, what's going to happen while we're doing this? Yeah. And you know, will we get the worst of the worst, and therefore they'll die, and our our model will be proven by by the captive industry not to work? Well, we have to be judicious. First of all, you would never take a whale just because it's offered. Who, who do you want to come with your whale? You want the people who are the caregivers of that animal to come with you, because they know the animal, and the animal knows them. So it's a, a real partnership that you have to create. And you're going to do all kinds of medical testing. You're going to work with that animal to get him acclimated, or him or her acclimated for a trip. And you're going to spend time. It's not. Well, we've got a whale, we'll be there with our truck and our sling and a plane. It's going to be a process. And we would be ill-advised not to take very strong candidates to begin this to prove that it can be done. So we also have to be judicious in the process, and we as judges do this. So is that a problem? Sure, it's a problem. But if all of us around the world are putting pressure on these parks, then, and the laws come into being, they're not going to be able to continue it anyway, and they have to come up with a different model as well. So I think it's all got to happen together, and it's politics, it's pressure, it's business, you got to do it all. I don't know how much time we have. Am I, does, is, is anyone worried about time? Okay, so anyway, yes, more questions. Yes, ma'am, here. Um, I was going to ask about the whales in Russia, actually. So what do you think is the best outcome for them? I read that they were talking about releasing them to the wild. Is that even realistic? So what is the best outcome for the whales in Russia? Is it realistic for them to be released? <laughs> A, they should be released back to the wild. The question isn't should it be. It's a question of when and how because they are now hundreds of miles from where they were caught. The groups they were caught from have moved. So if they were to be released where they are today, which some people have said, do it, let's get them out of there, it's horrible. I think that's ill-advised. I don't think that serves their welfare. But can we get experts from around the world, if the Russians would allow some experts from the US and from elsewhere to come in who've been through transport, who understand transport. No one has ever transported 100 animals at a time. They weren't transported all at once. When they got there, they came in groups. So there has to be a plan. It's a naval operation. And the ideal time is come spring. But you gotta care for them right now. The water is cold, you've gotta bring in devices to warm the water where they are so they don't freeze and the ice doesn't come in and tear up their skin. Got to make sure they're having the right food and they're healthy. So there's a whole process that should be taking place right now that people are trying to make sure is in Russia. There are a number of nonprofit groups actively working and putting pressure on the government. There are celebrities, Cousteau and others, putting pressure on Putin, asking for intervention, but at the same time, thoughtful intervention. So that's what has to happen. But should they go free? Yes. Then do you think that that's something that they're going to do? Because I heard I that Putin was thinking about saying, like, making a lot and, like, release them, they have to go back. But then if that's who's funding that, how would that happen? Unclear. It is, there's a lot of bureaucracy. Mark, I don't know if you want to add anything else to this. Mark's been very involved daily in this effort. Well, there has been some rumors that there are some uh, Russian uh, government groups that have offered funding for the uh, release of the animals. Whether it's going to be enough, I don't know. I think the government will have to take up a lot of the slack in terms of funding, so that's one of the issues that, that is before the government, and I'm sure one of the major issues that they're debating as well is whether or not to... I mean, there, there, there's basically a lot of debate amongst the Russian government folks. Uh, the original captures were illegal, uh, they violate Russian law, but they got their permits from some government <laughs> people. Uh, we suspect there's an oligarch uh, or two in uh, Moscow who is very influential, very rich, and probably uh, is gnashing their teeth right now and pushing very hard for them to release uh, the animals back to the companies to be exported to 
uh, China uh, aquariums because uh, you know you're talking about a million dollars each or more for each of the uh, orcas and probably hundreds of thousands of dollars each for the belugas for each uh, Chinese aquarium. Uh, China has about 36 new dolphinarium aquariums that are going to open in the next two years. 36. Uh, and that's in addition to all the other ones that are there and obviously when the animals die off, which they do very quickly, uh, they have to go out and get new animals. Yes, someone who hasn't asked a question. Yes, ma'am. Do you have an idea about the impact global warming will have on the whale sanctuary? And is that something you're budgeting or accounting for? So the question is, what about global warming and the like? Well, very much a part of site selection is looking at locations that at least you hope are going to be or, uh, sites that you can predict to the extent we can predict anything now uh, that will be sustainable over time. So you are looking for sites that are manageable from an environmental standpoint, looking at all the data you can. Uh, there's, there's, you know, are you in a tsunami area? All of those issues become part of site selection and are part of the criteria. I just gave you some high level criteria, but the moment you're down to brass tacks on a given site, you have extensive hydrologic and, and other studies that you have to do. Yes, yes ma'am, here. Uh, this question comes by way of my seven-year-old nephew who watched Free Willy on Sunday night in Washington yes, State. Still alive. Someone young that um, age still even knows who Free Willy is. It, I know. I, I, I did push him to, uh, he <laughs> really liked it and was crying in the first couple minutes. So um, He wanted to know what Keiko's personality was like. What was Keiko's personality like? He was wonderful. But of course that's it. But Keiko was. Keiko was, first of all, he had a tremendous group of caregivers who moved with him. One girl came from Mexico City and then he was for two years in the Oregon Coast Aquarium. He gained 2,000 pounds in weight, that's what I said while he was there. Got longer, got leaner, got stronger, and he had caregivers who he loved and who loved him. Now he had a personality. He, he knew who was who. And he, he would approach certain people right away. I mean, my wife, one of the greatest experiences of her life, the night before we flew him out of there, we were sitting up on the tank late in the evening with a few people with him, and he came over and put his head basically in her lap. <laughs> you know, wow, how does that happen? So, in any case, he had people he preferred, and other people he meh, wasn't as interested in, wouldn't necessarily follow their lead the same way. He and Jeff were like that but also he and a couple of the girls. But I mean, Jeff, Jeff had a very special bond with that animal. But yeah, Jeff, Jeff grew up with animals. I mean, he, his father was working with Diane Fossey. I mean, he's, he, grew up, he used to bring lion cubs home with, you know, when he was five years old, he'd play with a lion cub. So he's a little bit unusual person, but he had a bond with that animal and other people did as well. And, you know, I say he had a high quality of life. Why would I say that? by observing him. He would frolic in the water. Keiko would chase birds across that bay. And he never had that opportunity before. The first time we tried to feed him live fish, because you know, he's gonna have to eat live fish on his own. So you feed him live fish. He swims over, he catches it, he brings it back, opens his mouth and gives it back to you. <laughs> That's not food. I don't know what that is, but it's not food. And it took a long time before he thought something live was food. And then he'd go catch it and eat it. But it was not his first choice because why? That takes work. You're used to being fed by hand. That'd be true of us as well. So all of those things become factors in this. But his personality would always come through. And he was just a... You know, no one thought he could survive what he survived. I mean, he was basically the veterinarians in Mexico City said he was going to die. And it was people like Dave Six Phillips months. and others. And the veterinarian said, no, we're going to try this. And then you get a guy like McCaw who builds a facility for him at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. And then they didn't want to let him go because he was a cash cow for them. But that was the deal. If we could take him back, that was the plan. Every step of the way, he showed us he could do more. And it was him showing us, not us making the choice. So I found him to be robust, intelligent, and a great deal of fun.
but I'm not a whale. No, I'm not. <laughs> Just kidding. So, when you had Keiko's situation in Iceland, you set that up intentionally so that there would be the opportunity for Keiko to leave the enclosure and go out and kind yes. of encourage that. And can you tell me why you then are having the sanctuary kind of not have those steps in it in the way you're planning the sanctuary? Sure. So the question is, with in, in Iceland, clearly we built that to take Keiko out of it, to have Keiko go outside. Well, that was the reason. That was a reintroduction project. And I use reintroduction and not release for all the reasons I said earlier, because he's got to join family. He can't just go off by his own. He had to catch all his food by himself, 100 pounds a day or more. The amount of energy he would need by himself to do that is too much energy. In a family, they can all feed. So yes, we built that facility because it was a reintroduction project. And the team, the boats, all the infrastructure, everything was that way, which is why it was more expensive than certain other things. Why not do that with the sanctuary? <coughs> because there are so few animals that are candidates for reintroduction today. Now, there are some. We mentioned Corky, mentioned Lolita, and there may <coughs> be others. So on a case-by-case -case basis, I think you still always look for that opportunity. But in the main, these animals need care for the rest of their lives, 24-7, veterinarians, food, and the rest. What we're giving them is quality of life. They have made millions of dollars for their owners. They've entertained tens of millions of people. I think we owe them something. And why wouldn't those parks endow the animal to have that quality of life afterwards. Now that's a stretch, but you have to look at all the opportunities. So yes, on a case-by-case -case basis, we could still find ways to do it, but in the main, build the infrastructure to care for the animals, to give them higher quality of life. And there are so many that this is a project that's gonna want for a while. You'd love to be out of business, but unfortunately, as we just heard, it's gonna be a while. Yes? What percentage of the Captain Morgan's in the world or in the United States are um, captive born? Today, almost all. Yeah. Yeah, today almost all are captive born. That's why there are so few candidates where you would, because their families are artificial. They've been either artificially inseminated or you've got a Norwegian whale and an uh, and a Atlantic whale. You know, it's all a mess in terms of family structures. So how do you think about that for the wild and what would it mean? Now, we don't know. So maybe we'd be surprised. We have to be prepared to be surprised, but in the main, plan for what we do know. Yes, way in the back. Um, I'm curious about the um, behavior that you might predict in the sanctuary. With five to eight orcas from captivity, do you expect them to become a pod, or do you expect some kind of territorial fighting and how to intervene with that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, you will have all of that. And although the picture is one big open bay, it won't be that. There'll be segments. You'll have an area which is separated for an animal that you need to care for that might be ill or what have you. But you'll also have whales that may not get together and may not get along. And you'll need to separate them. And so you have to be prepared for all that and plan for it initially. Hopefully they'll get together. Will they form a pod? They, some of them will form pods, just as they do in captivity. They'll form a group, but you have to be careful and, and watch that and, and separate where you need to and care for them as you would. I mean, it's, a, it's still a confined space, but it's more than 100 times larger than the largest tank, performance tank anywhere, even at 60 acres. And we're only talking, why only five dead animals? To give them that space to make that change. And so I've been, you know, when people say, well, then we got to do five day day of whales, why do it at all? Because you start. Prove that it can be done, then show a model, create a model that everybody else can replicate, and it'll happen more. And maybe it's bigger. I was in Nova Scotia where the, this is, if anyone, no, I can't repeat this. <laughs> someone, someone will tell. The Broadour Lakes are huge. It's a lake, but it's, it's like a great lake. It's that big. And I was up there looking at some sites and just with the people in the car, he said, well, you take all 55 beluga from Marineland, put them in the lake. 
Who would know? Who would know? <laughs> <laughs> Won't happen. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, two years ago, I was in Newfoundland and, uh, at St. Anthony's. Sure. And you could see the whale. You can almost picture that picture <coughs> above me here with the whale. The pot is going toward the cliff, and they throw themselves into the cliff to kill the fish. So yeah. here they are all working together. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine that a, a solitary whale who didn't know their language could join a pod or could survive not knowing those kinds of tricks. Well, and initially he couldn't. That's why if you could find their family and they could communicate, what would be the time before they understood one another? I don't know. The dolphin, I mean, in, in, in South Carolina, dolphin do exactly the same thing. They'll come in. In, in this area, one area of South Carolina particularly, where there are a lot of mullet. And they'll wait for an incoming tide. And they'll rush the beach, create a wave, and all the mullet are pushed up on the beach. They all come up, always on their left side. And only on an incoming tide. They all feed like mad on the mullet, knowing that the tide's going to pull them back out. And for whatever reason, only on one side do they come in, on one side of their body. Same thing that you're seeing with the whales. But you said that Keiko made it all the way to Norway and didn't lose weight? So That's he correct. Was feeding well, and, well, yeah, I mean, can you know that for sure? I mean, we know, how, we know what his weight was. We know what his size was. And it was not just the trip to Norway. It was the whole three and a half weeks he'd been in Iceland with wild whales where we knew he was feeding on herring. There was a huge herring ball, which was why there were so many whales all together. Two more questions, and we're going to cut it off? OK, two more. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering how the locals took to, you know, when you said you're looking around, is it generally positive? And don't you have to get the buy-in of the government of the area, too? So how, how does it work with the sanctuary in terms of the locals? Really interesting. Uh, a project like this has to be based on the ex inclusive engagement of the whole community. Right, so I'm wondering how they react. So they we were in Nova Scotia for the last month. I was there for a month doing town meetings up and down the Atlantic <coughs> Coast. Press conference, then town meetings, public meetings just like this, everywhere. Show them a little bit of story, talk about what it is, and then do this for an hour or more about questions. And what we found was, and well, what we were looking for was a community or more, one or more, that wants to embrace the idea of a sanctuary first. Before we're talking about a site, they love the idea, they think it's a benefit to their community, and if they go that far, and coming out of a meeting like this, they create a committee among themselves to go off on their own and really decide whether they mean it, that they're engaged. And then come back to us and we'll work together with them to identify a site that they believe doesn't conflict with the rest of the things they're doing in their community. So it's that kind of a process that's critically important for engagement with the community. The hardest group is the fishermen, because basically they're saying, if, particularly if it's lobster fishermen or crabbing, if you've got whales there and you've got a net, I can't crab or lobster there. So that's a compromise. And it's a compromise of, a, of a, you know, their quality of life and their, their well-being, their, their job. So we've got to work that out. Find sites where it's less conflicting or not conflicting, or that compromise can be made because the community as a whole believes there are trade-offs that make sense and the fishermen agree. Now, ironically, from that, we had some real tough meetings with fishermen, uh, and yet they've now joined some of these committees. Now, will it result in a positive answer? I don't know yet. But that's two weeks old, three weeks old, and it's still going strong in these committees. That's the kind of engagement you need. Is the government going to be involved? Of course. You have to get a permit. Yeah. Now, in, in every community, in every jurisdiction, it's different. You've got certainly NOAA fisheries in this group, in this, the U.S. I've met with them in Washington and met with them regionally on the West Coast. They're intrigued. They're interested. They won't make a decision. They won't tell you how they really feel until you actually have a site. And you apply. But the permitting process, the legal process, the acquisition process, all of those are part of those skill sets you see on that wheel that you need in addition to caring for whales. Got to have it all. A big permitting process to come. One more question. 
Yes, ma'am. Gary. I have two. Okay, <laughs> two. You get two questions. Okay, thank you. Um, my first one, I had thought that whale pods or orca pods were pretty like matriarchal. And so I didn't think it was that odd for the males to be off, the adult males to be off on their own. But apparently that is odd. Like Keiko's behavior wasn't normal. Well, so the first question deals with matriarchal. In the main, orca pods are matriarchal. And the males leave the pod to mate, but they don't stay with their mate. They come back to their birth pod and stay with that and stay with their mother, who is really leading the foraging and the like, and they're dependent on her and she on them, the males, for food. So yes, they move off, but they tend to come back to that pod, not stay with others. There are some